the Duxford Aviation Society, may I welcome you. And a special welcome to our younger visitors and to any of you visiting Duxford for the first time. Duxford Aviation Society owns this concord that you're looking at, that we're going to be talking about today. Also, 12 other British airliners, some of them here in airspace and some outside on the flight line. I hope that some of you have already visited inside Concord. If not, please take the opportunity to do so afterwards. This aircraft was the third Concorde that was built. It was built to test a whole load of systems that make the aircraft fly properly before the passenger carrying aircraft went into service. We'll hear more about those test programs as we go along. You can read about them on the information boards behind the aircraft, or you can talk to our volunteer stewards if they're on duty. We're going to talk about the aircraft by means of an imaginary, sorry about that, imaginary flight from Heathrow, London, to JFK in New York. We'll be flying about 20,000 feet above the common or garden Boeings and Airbuses, and about 800 miles per hour faster than them as well. To do that, Concorde needs to be, as you can see, very streamlined. I'm being asked if you can hear me. Hands up if you can't, so to speak. Have you heard, can you hear me at the back there? Yeah? Up, up there? Up here, yeah? Okay. Was that a lower ears? Yes. Yeah. Thumbs up. As I was saying, the aircraft needs to be very streamlined in order to go so fast. And you can see that the front of it, the sharp bit here, is indeed very streamlined, and that causes a few problems, as we shall see as we go along. Our captain today is Captain Steve. Give him a wave, Steve, out the window. Do wave to Steve. He's been up there all week waiting for this, getting very late. We're ready to, okay, ready to take off. We've got 90 tonnes of fuel on board. The flight crew have spent about an hour going through their pre-flight checks. Passengers and baggage are loaded and the doors have been secured. So let's, uh, let's make her alive. We have the anti-collision lights and the navigation lights to come on now. Please, Captain. Those of you towards the front of the aircraft can see the navigation lights and the so before we taxi out, the flight crew can't see the taxiway or the runway because of that nose, that streamlined nose. They have very little forward vision. So the unique ability of the nose of Concorde was developed. Those of you up in the gallery there probably think that you can see the windows of the flight deck. In fact, you can't. What you're looking at is a transparent visor or heat shield. So the first thing we do is to lower the heat shield, the visor, please, Steve. And when that comes down, that's when you can see the flight deck windows. But that doesn't improve the visibility for the crew. They still can't see the runway. So now, as soon as that visor is down, the nose will be lowered five degrees below the horizontal. Okay, Captain, five degrees. Now they can see the runway and it's safe to taxi. So they start up two engines, taxi out. That's not as easy as it sounds, because if you'll look where Steve is sitting, where the Captain is, is about 30 feet in front of the nose wheel. So taxiing in that way takes a lot of anticipation, a lot of practice. So now we receive clearance from air traffic control. Speedbird 001 clear for takeoff. Engines go to full power. At about 70 miles an hour, the afterburners or reheat kicks in just feel being pushed back in their seats a bit more. Just under 250 miles an hour, she takes off. The reheat is on for about a minute altogether. And when it goes off, passengers experience a sort of forward motion. 
that they're falling forward out of their seats because the remit is no longer pushing them forward. Getting ready to go supersonic, the nose now comes up to the horizontal streamlined position. As soon as that happens, the visor can come back up to protect the flight deck windows. And when that visor is in position, suddenly the flight deck is quiet. No more noise from outside, no wind rushing past. Very quiet indeed. We're going through about 300 miles an hour now. Air traffic control will permit us to go up to Mac. 0.95 while we're over land, but about 17 minutes after takeoff or thereabouts, we're over the Bristol Channel, and if air traffic control let us, we're now ready to go supersonic. So full power again, full afterburner or reheat. The passengers feel two sort of nudges as the reheat comes on two engines at a time for about eight or nine minutes until we get to. Mach 1.7, that's 1.7 of the speed of sound when the reading goes off. They can go faster than that without the reheat through the design of the engine air intake. So that's one of the test programs this aircraft is involved in. Very clever design, nowadays used only on military aircraft to slow the air down as it goes into the engines. It's called super cruise. So the reheat's off, we're going up to Mach 2, twice the speed of sound. There are 50,000 feet. No sensation in the cabin. Actually, that's not quite true. Some of the passengers will have a pleasant sensation from the Champlain. As they go through the speed of sound, the centre of lift of the aircraft changes quite dramatically. So they are, the flight engineer up there is rebalancing the aircraft by fuel around between all the various tanks. That again is one of the test programs this aircraft was uh, used for. We're now going at 1,350 miles an hour. Let me say that again. 1,350 miles per hour. Every minute, 23 miles. This aircraft actually went faster than any other Concorde. The skin got very hot, the outer skin got very hot from the friction. So effectively they put a speed limit on the Concorde. Now let's jump ahead in time. Leave the passengers to their lobster and champagne. Sorry about that, you can have yours when you get home. We're now going to watch what happens with the approach and landing into New York. 50 miles out, slowing down to subsonic speed, below the speed of sound. When the airliner the aircraft descends, that's a time when quite probably they might get icing on the wings. That's a very dangerous situation for any aircraft. And again, this was one of the test programs this Concorde was designed to test, how to de-ice the wings. You can see a lot about that inside the aircraft when you visit. It's a Streamlined triangles in there. It's a Delta aircraft. And any Delta shaped aircraft, when it goes more slowly, puts it its nose up in the air. So now we're coming in with about 12 degrees of nose up in the air. And we need to get ready for landing. So the visor goes down again. Interesting. Followed by the nose going down to five degrees. And that's the same angle as for takeoff. But because the nose is sticking up in the air, because it's a triangular shaped aircraft, the flight crew won't be able to see the runway when they touch down. So the designers said we will lower the nose further down to 17 and a half degrees. Please, Steve. That's quite an angle. At that angle, they could certainly see the runway. 
the airline pilots tested out from their point of view, the Concords, and they didn't like it. They said, but we can't see the runway. And the designers said, that's the idea. And the airline pilots said, but we want to see the tip of the nose and the runway. When you park your car, it's a nice idea to see the corner of the front of the car so you know where it is in relation to the lampposts and the garden fence. And that's what the airline pilots wanted. They wanted to see the tip of the nose and the runway. So the designers said, yes, Captain. Some of them said, we want Captain. And they redesigned it to be 12 and a half degrees, which we now demonstrate, Steve. And at 12 and a half degrees, the airline pilot said, that's fine, we can see the front of the nose and we can see the runway. So now we're coming into land and the landing lights need to come on. Landing lights, please, Captain. The landing